Okay, welcome back to part two, uh, or chapter two of our CMT 140 lesson. Uh, this lesson we're going to be talking about a lot of the um, popular LAN topologies, their cable systems and access methods. So first, let's discuss uh, LAN topologies. Now, LAN topology is the logical and physical system of, inter of the interconnection of devices in a LAN. Now, in a structure cable installation, we provide the highways to move the data from one location to another. Now, the topology of the LAN describes how each device will interact with others and how the sum of all the devices uh, will be connected, or should I say interconnected, to function as a network. Now, an understanding of LAN topology and how the wires are hooked up will be very useful in our discussion on LAN wiring. In this lesson, we cover structured uh, wiring suitable for many of the popular types of LAN topologies that are used today. Now, most of the other chapters are concerned with the general use uh, wiring devices and installation techniques that are not specific to any particular LAN topology. This chapter will detail the two most popular types of LANs, Ethernet and Token Ring. We'll show several of their variations and show you how our system of structured cables can be used for each LAN. We will explain the wiring patterns and interconnections called the topology that are needed to support each type of network. We will not be covering the intimate details of a LAN protocols as this is not our topic and we'll just uh, show you how to connect them over structured cabling to make the network. So if you are generally familiar with common LANs or the with the OSI model, you will recognize the LAN topology as layer one, the physical layer, something that you can grab hold of, something that you can touch. Layer one is sub subdivided into additional layers. Now part of layer one comprises the actual wire connectors hubs that must be connected properly from the rest of the protocol uh, model in order to function. Now this wiring layer is critical to the functioning of the network. And if the wiring fails, the network fails. In this chapter, other than a very brief history of Ethernet cabling, we, we stick to modern shielded and unshielded twisted pair of copper, optical fiber uh, cabling, and the corresponding Ethernet and token ring networks that use these cablings. Now there are three basic topologies, and the three basic types of network topologies are the bus, ring, and star. In some lands, such as Ethernet, use more than one basic type. And three type, type of the topologies are illustrated here and are also illustrated in figure 2.1 in your book. And each topology has its advantages and disadvantages. In a bus topology, every device is connected directly to the same medium, uh, much like a power bus in a computer. Classic coax thick Ethernet and coax thin Ethernet are examples of a bus topology. Now, all devices on the bus can monitor data sent by any other device. And conversely, all transmissions go roughly simultaneously to all the other devices connected to the bus. Now, because the data pulses travel very fast and conflicts and conflicts between devices can occur, a bus topology must have strict rules to govern the operation of the network, including transmission timing, uh, connections to the bus, size of the bus, conflict resolution, and bus termination. Now, a ring topology connects each device to the next one on the network in turn with the very last device then being connected back to the first one in the form of a complete ring. Now, data is passed from one device to the next until it reaches the destination device. Now, the digital signals are typically reconstituted at each device node and a token scheme is often employed to regulate transmissions and to keep a device from hogging the available data bandwidth. A token ring and fiber distributed data interface, or FIDI, uh, are examples of ring topologies. Now, a star topology connects each device to a concentration hub at the center of the star. Uh, the all communication between these devices passes through the hub. Now, some people call this type of network a hub and spoke, but star is the more common name. Now, the very popular Ethernet hubs and switches. Uh, implement the star topology in modern day networks. Now, as the data signal passes from any connected device uh, to the hub or switch, a process called repeating you know, um, in Ethernet 
uh, reconstitutes the signal, regenerates it, and amplifies it, and then sends it along its way. Now, some network topologies are a hybrid of the basic topologies. So, for example, in token ring, the ring is normally cabled like a star, but the arms of the star are interconnected at the token ring hub, or a MSAU, which is a multi-station access unit in the, in the TR, so as to form this ring. Now, as you can imagine, each topology and LAN standard has its fans, as well as its detractors. So we'll, uh, we'll stay away from that contest except to point out when a wiring method can be used for several topologies. In this chapter, we're going to concentrate only on current technologies, including twisted pair and fiber optic, Ethernet, and token ring. Now, Ethernet twisted pair. The introduction of twisted pair wiring uh, into standard Ethernet networking ushered in a new age of network connectivity. Now, a standard was fashioned under the umbrella of the IEEE 802.3, in order to deploy a new twisted pair Ethernet topology called 10 base T. Now, they have been so successful that they have virtually eliminated the, ins the installation of new 10 base 5 and 10 base 2 networks. The need to specify a system of uh, universal telecommunications cabling uh, that would allow the proper operation of 10 base T gave rise to a series of new cable wiring and component standards and eventually resulted in an industry standard called the EIA TIA 568. Now, nowadays, that original 10 meg Ethernet is beginning to seem very slow. Ethernet networking has taken a jump first to 100 meg per second, then to a gig per second, and now even a 10 gig per second over twisted pair. Now, fortunately, the standard committees have kept pace with these developments and have released 100 meg, gig, and 10 gig standards for network adapters, hub switches, cable, and wiring components. Now, we're going to cover the classic copper or twisted pair, 10 base T topology first, because it is essentially identical to 100 and gigabase T in topology. In fact, combination network cards and switches that operate at either 10 or 100 will point out that the things that make 100 and gigabase T different. <coughs> Uh, 10 base T networking or 100 base T networking uh, and gigabase T uh, Ethernet topology is an active start rather than a what they call a tap bus topology or of 10 base 5 and 2. The, the operation of 100 base T is identical to 10 base T. This star topology is quite compatible with the standard home run method of commercial telephone style wiring. Although the use of existing telephone wiring was originally the goal of twisted pair Ethernet, the standards now recommend that, that special LAN certified twisted pair wire be used exclusively for the LAN network connections. Telephone wiring should be done using a separate cable to be uh, to totally in step with the standard uh, 10 100 base T hubs, um, a typical installation showed here behind me in figure 2-2 uh, in your books, the center of the uh, star topology is a 10-100 uh, hub. Now each workstation or server has a 10-100T uh, network adapter port that is connected to the hub over twisted pair cable. The standard specifies a maximum of 90 meter distance for each uh, cable leg, plus a total of 10 meters for interconnection, both at the workstation and at the hub. Modular cords, jacks, punch downs, cross necks, and patches are all allowed. Now while these wiring devices resemble their telephone counterparts, they are important differences, there are important differences that make them data grade. Now some of these differences are evident by the performance certifications needed to meet these standards for LAN wiring. A significant difference between 10100 and Ethernet coax topology is the addition of an active hub device. 10100 T still uses CSMA C D signaling method. Now remember, with the Ethernet coax topologies, any transmission by a station is passively distributed by the coax cable to all the other connected stations. And in 10100, uh, however, a transmission by a workstation first goes to the hub, which then repeats it or retransmits the signal to all the other connected stations. Each port thus acts as a transceiver. Now a 10100 hub or switch typically has 8, 12, 24, even more dual speed ports. Now dual speed hubs usually sense the speed of the connected device and then would adjust accordingly. 
Now the hub or switch is capable of converting to similar speed between any two or more ports. And a typical hub may be a standalone unit or part of a chassis with plug-in hub cards. Older standalone hubs usually had one port, each for thick and thin neck connections. In addition to a 10 uh, port, uh, but these uh, legacy ports are, are now uncommon. Now to recognize these legacy ports is easy. The thick net port has an attachment user interface, which looks like a serial port, and the thin net port has what we call a bayonet or a uh, naval connector, uh, the bayonet naval connector or what we call BNC. Now hubs may be used in combination together to build bigger networks by interconnection through one of the 10100T ports or through a thick net port or a thin net port if provided with one of the legacy ports. The 10100T interfaces can be converted to AUI or thin net interfaces or even a fiber optic link with appropriate transceivers or repeaters. And this was all covered in your CNT uh, 120 class as well. The active hub then gives the 10100T uh, some unique advantages over the coax because each hub port is repeated to the rest of the network. Each 10100T port is independent of the others. This means that the cable length of a given port is not affected by the cable length of any other port. It's much simpler to plan and test a 10100 uh, network because the cable length for a port must merely be less than the allowable maximum of 100 meters or 90 meters for your horizontal cable and the 10 meters for the patch and user cords at either end. Now as an added benefit, the hub can automatically isolate any port that misbehaves. 10100T switches, which is a variation of the 10100 uh, hub, is called a switched hub. Now these standard hubs send all packets to receive from any port to any other port. Now as you can see here in the figure behind me, uh, in figure 2, 3 in your books, in this way they share the twisted pair of media among all ports. Undesired collisions can sometimes occur because there are so many devices sharing the same collision domain. In order to reduce this problem, it is possible to use a simple technique called layer 2 switching. Now a switched hub is a very significant improvement in network uh, interconnection. And in most situations, non-broadcast and non-multicast, a network intends to send each data packet to one other device on the network. The switch can identify these two stations through their unique layer 2 media access uh, addresses. Initially, the switch learns the MAC addresses of each connected device and then notes its associated port in internal table. From then on, the switch knows how to send data packets only to a particular switch port that has a device attached to it. Now, this technique greatly minimizes traffic going to individual ports, allows two or more transmissions to from two or more stations on independent ports to occur then simultaneously and can allow a high-speed uplink to a backbone server to handle many simultaneous data exchanges with workstations. Now the basic operation of a switched hub is shown here behind me and the 10100T advantages uh, are, are displayed here. Now a real advantage to to the 10100 based T network is that workstations may be interconnected to or disconnected from hubs or switches without interrupting other stations on the network. Hubs usually have status lights that indicate proper connection on the 10 uh, base T ports and collisions or other error conditions. Standard 10 base T hubs will uh, automatically isolate a port for a wiring reversal or a short. Now a special wiring configuration of the common A-pin modular jack that is used by some telephone equipment. Now two pairs of the wires are used. One, of the, one for the transmit data and one for the receive data. The connections are, are polarity sensitive. That means that the connection will not operate if the two wires of either pair are reversed. The wiring of a 10 base T interface is shown here behind me. Now although the 10100 base T uses only two, two wire pairs, it is customary to use four pair cable to make the station drops. Now several of the 100 megabit network schemes require all four pairs. In addition, a jack is wired for all four pairs and that can support many other types of data and voice connections which may use some other combination of the eight uh, connector pins. Some installations use the other two pairs 
for a telephone connection or for another 10100 base T connection. Be wary of telephone installers stealing your network wiring pairs for their use. Telephone wiring is often at cross, um, at cross purposes from network wiring. And the standards are different, as are the installation practices. 10100T and structured wiring in the TIA 568C wiring standard supports 10100 wiring. 100 base T requires category 5 or greater to run its rated distances, although it may be uh, able to operate for shorter distances at a lower category of cable. Now, cabling 10100T is simply a wiring star of hubs and nodes. Generally, a hub is located centrally. Perhaps in a TR and station cables are run at each workstation location. The cables may be terminated in a patch panel or in a punch down block adjacent to the hub. A patch cord or oct octopus cable then connects each station cable to a hub port. And at the workstation location, station cables are normally terminated in a wall jack and the user cord connected to the workstation. The wiring can be the standard two pair 10 100 uh, wiring shown here behind me. However, the mo more robust four pair wiring pattern of the TIA EIA 568C offers effectively the same connections. A connector's jack in internal wiring may, may present some confusing variations in wire colors and numbering. Some of these variations are shown here behind me. Now note that the wiring colors may be completely different from those at the station cable and the plates sometimes have numeric markings that do not correspond to the pin numbering of the jack itself. Fortunately, 100 t has the ability to sense misconnections, and the hub status light for the port is a good diagnostic tool. Inexpensive modular test indicators are also available to help you make this connection. All wiring 10100 is straight through uh, connections, meaning pin 1 to pin 1, pin 2 to pin 2, and so on. Each leg of the 10100 t network is limited to 100 meters or 328 feet. Of this, 100 meters, 90 meters typically may be the station wire and an additional 10 meters that uh, may be the uh, total for the patch cord, cross connect, and workstation cable. Cable component installation standards should be in accordance with the 568C uh, category 3 or for 10 meg or higher, preferably for Cat 5E or higher for today's networking speeds to get you up to a gig. Now note that either the T 568A or T568B modular jack wiring patterns will support 10100T. Now just be sure that you use the same patterns at each end of the cable, whether in the wall or as a, um, as a user patch cord. Terminations of the wires is covered in detail in part two of our books. The duplex pattern shown is technically not allowed in the TIA 568B which only lets you use one service per cable. In some circumstances, duplexing the cable will work just fine for low speed data or possibly data voice combination. Duplexing may limit your distances and may preclude 100 meg operation. <clears throat> but you should use this workaround cautiously and either run a new cable or install a small hub as soon as you can. I personally have never had the opportunity to get a duplex cable to actually work uh, in that we end up with a uh, uh, IP conflicts and crosstalk. Now if you're having a problem, the hub status sites can diagnose total failures of the cable to a workstation or server. Is there a light or isn't there a light? Common cable failures include damaged wires, connectors, pulled, loose or not properly seated, and poor improper connection of the modular plug. Use only the expensive tool and die type crimp tools for 8 pin plugs. The cheaper tools will not properly seat the center contacts of the plug and cable and may fail. In addition, you should be cautious if you use solid wire with modular plugs. If the cable tests well, suspect that the workstation's network adapter is the problem. If the problem is a single workstation, uh, it's probably going to be the network adapter. Now, if all workstations are affected, suspect the hub or any other thin other thick connect connections between the hubs or two other devices. Uh, for 100 base T cabling issues, we have standards for 100 meg fast Ethernet networks that have evolved rapidly. Now, many proprietary methods and interim standards 
were put forward since the 10 base T was first introduced. The IEEE 802 Standards Committee resolved the competing technologies with a supplement that details the implementation of 100 base T. Now, there are two copper wire 100 base T variations under what is known as the 802.3U supplement. Now, they are 100 base TX and 100 base T4. Now, a companion 100 base FX rounds out the 100 meg CSMA CD standard offering uh, and the non CSMA CD 100 VG Anyland and the IEEE 802.12 uh, after much debate. Now, these 100 meg Ethernet topologies are sometimes referred to as fast Ethernet. The implementations of the two main standards, TX and T4, differ in the minimum link performance category and the number of pairs that were required. The important point is that either of the copper fast Ethernet standards can be supported on an unmodified 568C cabling system, although the required category of the wire is different. And implementations of both fortunately offer backward compatibility with 10 base T signals and networking equipment. Now, because of the differences, though, let's cover them one at a time. 100 base TX, the simplest and by far most popular of the fast Ethernet standards. The standard is quite similar to 10 base T, except that it runs at 100 meg per second 10 times faster. Hubs, switches, and network interface cards often offer dual 10 100 meg uh, speeds uh, with uh, automatic sensing. Also, it requires only two pair, one for transmit and one for receive. The pairs are wired exactly the same as the 10 meg version. The main difference from the slower standard is that the signal itself is at a full 100 meg data rate. A CAT5 or CAT5E or higher link is required. The signal is simply too fast for CAT3 or CAT4 cables. This may be the primary justification for placing CAT5, CAT5E, or even Category 6 component standards into any new cable installation. Remember that all components, not just the wire, must meet the CAT5, 5E, or 6 category, and proper installation techniques have to be used. The wiring pattern for 100 base TX is shown here behind me. Now you'll notice it is identical to the 10 base T wiring pattern, although only two pair are required for this topology. It is still recommended that all four pair be connected in the 568A pattern uh, given by the TIA EIA 568B. Now, an additional feature allows negotiation between NIC and the hub to determine whether the NIC can support 100 meg and enable a failback or a fallback to uh, uh, 10 base T if both devices are not 100 base T compatible. <clears throat> now this is a real advantage if you're gradually upgrading to 100 meg. You can install dual 100, 100, 10, 100 meg NIC cards in all your new workstations at a relatively little, little extra cost. And for, in reality, Good luck even trying to uh, find a 10 meg card today. Now when you change your hubs to 100 base TX, the dual speed cards will automatically upshift to 10 times the old speed and the link will run at 100 meg per second. Now 100 base TX network has some rather severe distance restrictions in a shared hub only environment. Now because of the timing constraints of CSMA CD, the total radius of the network is one tenth the size of a 100 meg Ethernet network. Hub may be linked but only on a very short backbone of 5 meters. The hub ports, which function as repeaters, can be linked to uh, stations by 100 meters of cable, which then fits into the, 560, I'm sorry, the 568C limit of 90 meters plus your 10 meters. Uh, this computes to a maximum station to station distance of 205 meters. A fiber link from a hub to a bridge router or switch can be up to 225 meters and a non-hub fiber link can be 450 meters with CSMA CD enabled and 2 kilometers disabled. Now these limits encourage the use of fast Ethernet switches, strictly speaking, are not repeated. I mean switches, strictly speaking, are not repeaters, but rather layer 2 bridges and absolve you from the tight time limits of hubs and repeaters. An industry problem exists in the, in the environment that has both 10 and 100 meg stations. Any simple hub 
must be only one speed, either 10 or 100, because a 100 meg station obviously cannot transmit to a 10 meg station without some conversion. Now the hub or switch must buffer the high speed data packets and restrain the higher speed port to allow time to send the packets out at the slower data rate. 100 base T4. Originally, for networks built to accommodate 10 base T wire speeds, um, the move to 100 meg was a tough one. Now many twisted pair networks were installed with CAT3 wiring standards that do not accommodate the 100 base TX line speed. Now for those installations that have installed 4 pair category 3 cable, a standard called 100 base T4 allows the operation of a 100 meg CSMA, C CSMA CD connection over CAT3 by using all 4 pairs rather than only 2. Now for older installations, the implications of this are enormous if you have a large installed base of 10 meg users. You can selectively increase your LAN connections to 100 meg without pulling new Category 5 cable. Now this can save a lot of money if you have a large number of terminals. Now we have to talk about Ethernet fiber, 10, 100, and gigabit. Now Ethernet standards allow the use of fiber optic cable at 10, 100, or gig. Emerging standards will even allow the speed to grow to 10 gig. Now this section briefly, will briefly describe the Ethernet fiber standards, 10 base FX wiring. Uh, first, now the increasing use of fiber optics to transport Ethernet signals over extended distances or between buildings eventually led to the standardization of this method by the IEEE committees. Now the 802.3 standard now recognizes several variations of the fiber optic link that started out as the fiber optic interrepeater link, or FOIRL. The replacement of the FOIRL is known as 10 base FL. Now this standard, as the original name implies, is used to interconnect repeaters, although several manufacturers have used it to link stations as well. Now additionally supplements to the 82.3 standard have added 10 base FB and FP. Now the FP specification is a synchronous Ethernet link between repeaters that extends the limit for repeaters and segments in a single unbridged network. Normal repeaters use a portion of the preamble of these net package to distinguish incoming data from noise and to synchronize with the data. Each repeater, in effect, gobbles up some of these sync bits, which limits the number of repeaters a packet can traverse. Now remember, a repeater does not store and forward a packet, so the lost bits cannot be replaced in the outgoing signal. Synchronizing the link means that the repeater must only distinguish data from noise and the entire preamble may be preserved. The 10 base FP specification is a passive star configuration for, optic, for fiber optics. Now the signal is shared with other fiber arms of the star via a unique system of optical distribution. All of these 10 base F standards use graded index 62.5 slash 125 uh, UM fiber optic cable with two fibers per limb, one for transmit and one to, uh, for receive. Now the distance limits are, uh, are two kilometers for 10 base FL and 10 base FB and 500 meters for a passive star on 10 base FP. The 10 base FX data rates, of course, are the same, 10 meg as copper, 10 base T, and consequently offer distance and electrical isolation as the primary advantages over copper. Now, an active point-to-point -point fiber optic links offer a few problems that are not quickly revealed by the link status indicators. The 10 base FP installation, however, does present the same problems as the coax copper star of ArcNet since the hub is passive and has no indicators. Fiber optic links offer unique advantages such as extended transmission distances and immunity to interference. However, fiber is not indestructible and may require some special handling during and after installation. For example, fiber optic cable is susceptible to moderate severe performance degradation from a one-time bending of the fiber below the bending minimum radius. While light may be required to um, troubleshoot a fiber optic insulation, fast Ethernet and 100 base FX and SX wiring. 
the 100 base FX standard allows Ethernet transmission at 100 meg using multi-mode fiber at the long wavelength or 1300 nanometers. The 100 base FX standard allows links of up to 2000 meters and is widely used both in high speed fiber backbone uplinks and in campus links between buildings. The less expensive light emitting diode LED uh, transmit sources are generally used. As FX uses a different light wavelength, the 10 base FL is not compatible or upgradable. The 100 base SX standard, on the other hand, uses a uses the same short 850 nanometers wavelength that 10 base FL uses. Now this allows a transceiver to be designed that can handle either speed and allows for a gradual migration from 10 to 100 meg or even a gig. However, the SX distance is limited to about 500 meters because of the characteristics of multi-mode fiber at that wavelength. Both 100 base FX and 100 base SX support the relatively short 100 meter distances of the horizontal cabling in the TIA EIA 568C standard. The 100 meter link is no problem to fiber, which is inherently greater, which, in, which it's, with its inherently greater signaling distances, the moderate backbone uh, connections of 300 meters are also easily accomplished by 100 meg Ethernet fiber. Gigabit Ethernet, or uh, 1000 base SX and LX wiring, uh, the majority of the gigabit Ethernet cabling is done at either uh, 1000 base SX or LX. Now, as fiber was the first available technology for gigabit, it naturally has a significant installed base. However, both these gigabit fiber standards are relatively t uh, limited in distance capability. They will, they will both easily handle the 100 meter horizontal limit of the uh, 568C, but when used for backbone or centralized fiber, they range in distances from as little as 220 meters to 550 meters. Now, of course, these are the minimum limits for the uh, uh, 802.3Z. So most manufacturers exceed these distances by, uh, <clears throat> by moderate amounts. Now, as with the other fiber standards, the S stands for short wavelength of uh, 850 nanometers and is used with multi-mode fiber. And the L indicates the longer wavelength, which is the 1300 nanometers for multi-mode and 1310 for single mode. Now, as it turns out, the distance ranges for each technology also mock the S for short distance and L for longer distances. Several longer range offerings are emerging from the extension of gigabit Ethernet into large canvas and metropolitan area networks. Among these are proprietary operating modes called SLX, ELX, and ZX that extend the fiber distances to 10, 70, and even 80 kilometers respectively. Now these longer distance gigabit uh, connections mean that many networking applications can use the commonly associated IP networking within a metro area. Now a 10 gig Ethernet uh, or uh, 10 G base SX LX4 LR and copper 10 G base T and CX wiring um, uh, who would um, if you think about that who would have thought that 20 years ago that we would seriously be talking about transmitting our data at that 10 gig per second um, over fiber optic let alone over a twisted pair of copper cable. But that is what we've achieved. And with any new technology, the 10 gig Ethernet or 10 uh, GBE, as the IEEE uh, calls it, is primarily, primarily used for high capacity backbones in high performance environments. Now, for example, the so-called backbone network that interconnects large computers or large web server networks is uh, an application made for a multi-gig um, uh, connection. Now, as with the 1 gigabit Ethernet, 10 gigabit Ethernet also uh, offers choices between multi-mode and single-mode fiber and between unshielded twisted pair and twin X copper. Now, officially, the physical interconnections for 10 gigabit Ethernet are called 10G base X, where the X stands for uh, a two uh, one or two letters that describe the cabling technology. 
Now the fiber options for 10 uh, gigabase X and include SX, LX4, and LR. Now some of these run over multi-mode fiber, but they're not going to go very far. And some run over uh, single-mode fiber and you can go up to 10 kilometers, which is roughly 6 miles, which is very respectable. Now as with 1 gigabit Ethernet, multi-mode fiber's optical bandwidth greatly influences the 10 gigabit Ethernet transmission distances. And in all cases, 50 micron fiber um, fares much better than 62.5 uh, fiber. Now, single mode fiber has an easier time of it. It can actually let you reach up to 10K. Now, the basic topology of a 10 gigabase network is essentially the same as its slower cousins. Wiring can be run directly between two devices or through an active star, hub, or switch. Fiber still gets you the greatest distance, but you may have to replace older fiber types to achieve the distances that you want. The copper 10 gigabase T, on the other hand, endeavors to hit the magic 100 meter range of the 568C structured cabling standard. Unfortunately, it's unlikely you can get 10 gig, 10 gig T to work without a cable plant upgrade, unless you were fortunate enough to install an enhanced version of CAT6 cabling. Now, Category 7 cabling are shared systems that can support 10, gig, um, 10 gigabase T fairly easily, with, uh, which uh, certainly throws some cold water in the face of the, the, those who were uh, saying that uh, CAT7 wasn't going to be any different than CAT6 or wasn't worth it. Now, not only is there a demonstrated need for 10 gig, but there is now a true calling for a CAT7 or Class F standard. So the next thing we need to talk about, and it's the last thing that we're going to talk about tonight, is token ring. Now IBM and others introduced token ring networks back in the mid-80s. The network te topology is now embodied as the IEEE 802.5 standard. Token ring was originally implemented on a shielded twisted pair cable or STP using a unique type of connector. Uh, commonly called the IBM data connector. Now this cable type and connector is now specified in the 560AC standard and more recently token ring has been migrated to conventional unshielded twisted pair cable. Now what we simply call twisted pair is, is what, um, or UTP is what we just call twisted pair for the majority of this whole entire class. Now token ring has a clever topology that allows an electronically continuous ring to be, or electrically continuous ring, to be implemented with wiring that is installed in a hub star configuration. Each arm of the star is called a lobe. Now I've shown here behind me in figure 2A in your books, a special type of wiring hub called a multi-station access unit, or an MSAU, allows signals from workstations or from servers or bridges to be looped through the network station in turn until the signal is only looped back to the beginning workstation. Now this effectively turns the star wiring into a loop or a ring from uh, which the token ring gets the uh, ring part of its name. The token part of the name comes from the fact that there's a so-called token being passed from station to station. It's a station to station. It's a free uh, data token along with the data commands and acknowledgements go along with it. Now, the land signal thus proceeds in an orderly fashion around the ring in the loop. Now, that's a very simple explanation of the process. Now, a station may transmit only when it has the token. It's like getting that talking stick. You cannot talk until, until you have the stick. And the, the, token, the uh, talking stick will go around the ring and around the ring, and when it gets to your station, you get an opportunity to grab that stick, and when you have the stick, you put your data out on the line. Your data will then traverse that line until it gets to its destination, at which time a free token will then be put back out onto the loop. Now, the token ring signaling structure is called a differential Manchester code, and it has no DC voltage component, so it can thus be directly inductively or capacitively coupled to networking components. Now this lends itself to the self-healing aspect of the physical topology. The multi-station access unit is the key to the architecture. Now some people also call them a MAU or MAU. 
Um, and a lot of token ring users will say that, but it's different from the Ethernet component that actually has the same name. Now, each port of the MSAU contains a small relay that connects the ring signal to the next port. Now, in turn, when no cable is plugged in, if no cables are plugged in, the the ring will go. Uh, the the it will be ring will just become a small ring within itself. Now, as each cable is plugged into a port on the on the MAU or MSAU, a phantom voltage from the associated workstation opens the relay and the ring is signal and then it's diverted to the next cable down the workstation. The workstation monitors the ring signal and repeats it back to the MAU where it can then be di diverted to the next active station. If a workstation is not active or powered up or inserted, the relay remains closed and then bypasses the ring signal to, signal to the next port, ignoring the attached cable, which is greatly different from the way it used to be. It used to be quite difficult to add or remove uh, uh, devices to and from a uh, token ring network. Now the data rate of a token ring is either 4 meg or 16 meg per second. A particular ring must operate at just one speed. So a ring may be extended to additional mouths, though the ring in, ring out ports, or through the ring in and uh, ring out ports of each mouth. Now copper repeaters and fiber optic repeaters or converters may be used to extend the distances of the ring. Rings are joined together by means of bridges or routers, as within other network topologies. The token ring cabling, however, uses two pairs of wires to connect each workstation to the map. The pair may be incorporated in a shielded or unshielded cable that typically comprises four pairs. The popular IBM cabling system uses STP cabling in conjunction with special data connectors or jacks and cables to support the traditional token ring installations. Uh, UTP wiring normally uses an 8-pin modular RJ45 style plug and jack, and it is called a medium-dependent uh, medium interface connection in the 802.5 terminology. Now, the wiring pattern patterns in the data connector and the 8-pin modular jack are shown here behind me, and it's also figure 2.9 in your books. A station wire for the token ring requires two pairs and a cable may be either STP or UTP. Cables are always running the star pattern from each workstation outlet to a central wiring closet. And that, has to, that also supports the 568C wiring standard, which supports token ring networking because it contains four pairs in a compatible pattern. Now, CAT3, 4, or 5 wire will carry either the 4 meg or 16 meg data rates. CAT5 E standards offer future growth to 100 meg networking and the standard distance limits for the station cables uh, which are specified in the 560AC standard will take care of token ring networks in most instances. Now, because each workstation acts as a repeater to the next workstation. Now that's all we're going to cover on token ring in this lecture. For more information on troubleshooting and limitations of token ring please refer to chapter 2. That's all for now. Please move on to the online assessments, and I'll see you in class for any questions and answers uh, that you may have, and then we can begin our hands-on labs. See you.